Hello everyone, welcome back to CS395. I'm Sam, this is week 7, and we're going to be talking about ROP, PLT, and GOT. Um, these are all acronyms that probably mean nothing to you right now, uh, but over the course of this lecture, hopefully, you will, well, not hopefully, you will be an expert on all of these topics, for the most part. Um, but first we have some uh, prior knowledge to get out of the way. So, we need to talk about L files themselves, in case you haven't figured it out yet. Um, the binaries that we've been working on all semester are L files. Uh, and this is basically just, you know, the Linux version of executables, uh, or there, if you're a Windows person, uh, the Linux version of a .exe, pretty much. Um, so there's not just, you know, machine instructions in here. It's not just our code that goes into these uh, files. There's actually a lot of metadata, um, you know, information about uh, what's inside the file. Um, just uh, hidden in there, and it's information that uh, we as cool hackers um, want to get into. So you can use like the read elf tool. We'll show you um, all of the different sections that an elf file has in it, and um, read elf a will show you uh, just everything. And this is only a, a small snippet of all the information you can get uh, just from analyzing an elf because there's just that much stuff in it. Um, if you aren't familiar with these, uh, with any of these sections or uh, what uh, what an L file is, I recommend uh, looking at these two links right here. And this is just the Wikipedia page for an L file, but it is um, important. You don't need to know too much about it, um, but uh, that is good reading. So uh, the other thing we need to review is uh, the x86-64 calling convention. Now uh, we briefly went over this, I think, in uh, 367 if you've taken that, but all you need to know is that in a 32-bit x86, um, its function arguments, when, a, when it's calling a function, they're stored on the stack exclusively, that's just where they all go, but in a 64x86, which is what we've been using in this class, and uh, what most modern systems are using, uh, they store their function arguments in uh, these registers, uh, in these six registers, and if there's more than six function arguments, then the Remaining uh, arguments go on the stack, but uh, that probably won't happen in this class. So we're just using these six. So in this class, this is what a function call would look like. If we called some function with the arguments x and y, x would go into RDI and y would go into RSI. Uh, and that's important for what we'll talk about later. Uh, but for now, let's talk about ROP. Yes, uh, ROP stands for return, return oriented programming, sorry. Um, in case you were wondering. Uh, it's a very helpful technique, mainly for getting around uh, NX and DEP. So when the stack is not executable, uh, so you can't use shell code, um, this, is what, this is what you want to do, uh, is use the ROP technique. So instead of uh, pushing your own shell code onto the stack, uh, what we do is we um, replace the return address with um, segments of code that is already in the binary. So we're basically hopping around uh, to uh, different snippets of code inside the binary uh, to do what we want. So we can make rudimentary shell code uh, without having to actually write anything of our own. We can just use what's already there. That might not make sense. So here's a nifty diagram. Um, yeah, let's just go over this. Uh, gadgets you use must end in a return instruction. This is why it's called return-oriented programming. Uh, Hopefully you guys know that the ret instruction pops um, an address off the top of the stack and places it in the instruction pointer. So basically it pops a value off the stack and then runs whatever, uh, whatever that address is pointing to. So what this means for us is if we put our gadget addresses or just a gadget address or multiple, um, we can have it run some code and then return, which pops your other gadget off the stack and then runs whatever's there and returns and you can just uh, create what's called a ROP chain, um, which is a bunch of ROP gadgets that uh, run after each other. And this is basically, you know, arbitrary code execution with with some limits depending on uh, what gadgets you have in the binary. And I keep using this word gadgets. What, what does this mean, Sam? Well, I'll show you. Uh, we get our gadgets um, by using a tool called Ropper. In this class, there are a couple other tools. This is the one we're using here. I'm pretty sure Pwn tools can do it. But uh, this is simpler, so we're going to stick with this for now. 
But as you can see, it's, it's simple to use Ropper dash F uh, vom, which will just you know find uh, gadgets inside of uh, any binary. And it'll give us a, a long list. This is just a few here of um, you know a string of assembly that ends in return. Uh, and if you're wondering why we should care about this, these, these are all uh, weird. We probably wouldn't use these. But what we are interested in is the more powerful gadgets, specifically uh, ones that pop into registers. Um, like I showed you guys earlier, registers are used for the calling convention in x86 when, when functions are called. So using these gadgets, like you can see here, we have a pop RDI gadget and a pop RSI gadget right underneath it. So using these two uh, gadgets, you can control you know, the first two function parameters of any uh, function call if you uh, had the address of that function as well. So you could call a function. Uh, well, first, you would put these, uh, use these two gadgets to put something you wanted as the arguments into the registers and then call a function. And then you basically just uh, did that all by yourself with no shell code. You just called an arbitrary function with arguments that you specified yourself. Uh, which is very leet and hackery of us, and that's exactly what we want to do in this class. So, um, let's. Hopefully, this is making sense. Uh, if it's not, it is. When I, it's about to make sense when I uh, demonstrate this excellent technique. So, let's first run this binary before I start. We start looking at the source code. Uh, if we run it dot slash vaughn, it says, look at this cool string I found, ben sh. That is a really cool string. I'm glad it shared that with us. And then it asked us for our name, like so many programs in this class seem to do for some reason. Um, so let's do that, and nothing happens. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, if we look at the Ghidra of this, well, actually, yeah, let's actually look in Ghidra, not the slides. Um, so yeah, just go to the main function, and you can see that... We have uh, local 1a, which just looks like uh, whatever this is. Um, and we can see that it um, prints it off. So we actually know that this is bin sh right here. So we can uh, rename that. This is now bin sh. Um, and then it says input your name. And then it uses gets, which is very silly. Um, so this is a free buffer overflow right here. And then it says hello to us. Very nice. Um, OK. Not a lot, you know, to go off of here. It just gives us a free buffer overflow. But since, you know, ASLR will be on for this challenge, um, and NX is on, uh, we we can't use shell code. So what do we do from here? Well, uh, if you look over in the functions, there's actually some sort of secret-looking function here, a get shell uh, function that takes a single character pointer, and then it uh, calls system on that character. So Whatever we pass, uh, whatever string we pass get shell, it's going to run it through system. Uh, and wait a second, wasn't there some sort of interesting string? Oh, right, yeah, if we pass bin sh to this, uh, to this function, uh, then we, uh, then it'll give us a shell. Uh, hence the name get shell. So that's very interesting. Uh, now I will demonstrate that to you guys uh, using the ROP and pwn tools method. All right, so let's get started. Uh, I already have demo.pilot out here for us because I want to explain this real quick. Uh, this, this is different from what we've done before. We're using context.binary is equal to elf uh, is equal to big elf dot slash volume. So big elf just gives us a, uh, an, uh, returns an elf object of dot slash volume, which is the, um, you know, the binary that we're working on right now in this directory. Uh, and then we're assigning that to uh, an elf, a variable named elf here, so we can use this in our script in just a second. And then we're also setting context.binary equal to the same thing. And uh, what this is, is it's just um, for Pwn tools, I think it's a, a static variable for Pwn tools to know. Yeah, this is the binary we're exploiting, um, and it does some behind the scenes things to make Pwn tools more uh, compatible with the specific binary that we're using. Uh, so it's good practice to always set uh, context.binary at the beginning of your exploit. It's not always necessary, um, but uh, we'll be used, we'll be doing it. Uh, now we just want to hack this binary like we've like we've started out with any other. We want to find the distance between the vulnerable buffer and our return address. So 
uh, we'll do the usual IO is equal to process dot slash vol. And actually, no, we're not going to do that. That's what the, uh, not anymore. Now that we have an elf object, we can just do elf dot process. And that'll run it for us. So that's a cool new way of doing that. <laughs> um, then we want to send it our cyclic payload. So let's, I like putting the payload up here just for clarity. I think it looks nicer. So we'll do cyclic, say 300 should be good. Uh, more than enough even. And then we want to do, let's, we want a gdb.attach to IO. So we can actually see where our program crashes. And then we want to send our payload as well. And then we'll just throw in a, uh, an interactive call here as well, just for giggles, even though we know it's going to crash. Um, so now we just want to run that. And yep, okay, cool. And we get the world's smallest GDB terminal. So let's make that bigger. Break it main and uh, run. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, sorry about that. I'll just do that again. Break it main and continue, not run. Uh, and we seg faulted. Cool. Uh, and it looks like we have AAFA on the top of the stack here. So we'll do our classic uh, cyclic dash L AAFA. And that will tell us that we have 18 bytes between the vulnerable buffer and our uh, return address. So we'll go back into demo and replace our payload with that number. Um, cool. 18, not 18. Uh, want to do 18 A's. Cool. So, great, we figured that out. We have access to our return address. Now, what did we actually want to do with that again? We'll look at Ghidra and remember that we want to call get shell uh, and pass it the string bin sh. And the string bin sh, we know, is just sitting in main waiting for us to, to use it. Um, so we know that the string is actually built into the uh, the elf binary. So that means we can pull it out and use it whenever we want. Uh, oops. Yeah. So how do we actually find the string bin sh? Um, Pwn tools makes it very, very, very easy. We can just uh, make a variable called bin sh. Uh, and we can search for strings within binaries in uh, elf files by using elf.search. Um, and this is great. So we can uh, search for the string bin sh. And um, this actually returns a generator. So we have to use the, uh, the next uh, keyword, actually, to get the string from it. And also, um, we want if we're going to use this in our uh, payload, uh, we, we want to p64 it so that way it's good for little Indian and this will now give us the the memory address of the string bin sh in our binary uh, let's just triple check by having it printed out for us um, okay so actually this is a good opportunity to show you guys something I have gdb.attach I forgot to comment it out um, when I just left my script. I just want to check the print statement real quick. I don't really want to open up that uh, whole new terminal and have to close it out. So you can just add the word knob trace to the end of your uh, command when you're running your script. And that will, uh, it'll tell Pwn Tools that you don't want to actually run any of your GDB stuff. Um, so I can just easily run it and it won't um, GDB.attach. And you can see that it printed off our, what's a very handsome looking uh, address. So cool. I'll just trust that that is, um, that is actually the address of bin sh. All right, so cool. We have our uh, string bin sh. Now we have, uh, we want to call get shell. So of course to do that, we need the address of get shell. And uh, we've done that before using, you know, GDB info functions 
and uh, object dump to find the address of um, of of its address. But it is the year 2021. We are not caveman rubbing sticks together. We have pwn tools. We have technology. So we're just going to use. Um, we'll make a new variable and we'll call it get shell, uh, and we'll set it equal to. We can use the function. Not a function actually. It's a dictionary. Elf dot symbols lets us take a gander at the uh, entries in the symbol table, uh, which basically what that means is we can just type in a get shell here, and it's the same thing as above. It'll um, just give us the address of the function get shell. Uh, and actually, we do need a P64 it again. I am a forgetful person today. Um, that should be good. Let's also uh, triple check this. Because I have little faith in myself. Um, and uh, no, actually, I'm a genius. It worked. So, done with that. All right, we have our uh, bin sh string. We have our get shell address. Uh, what else do we need? Um, well, we want to load bin sh uh, into RDI so we can call get shell uh, using this as an argument. And then that'll give us a shell. So, now here's where the real wrapping comes in. We need a gadget to do that. Um, so we'll use our classic wrapper dash f vom. Um, this is, uh, I don't feel like going through all these. I just want to look at the pops, the pop instructions. So uh, what you can do is um, dash dash search and do like pop rdi. Um, and that won't work because I think you need to put it in quotes. Yeah, okay, cool. So you can see we have a um, our uh, pop RDI return gadget. So we can just copy that. And uh, we'll make a new variable, call it uh, pop RDI, so we know what it does. And then uh, p64 it, paste it, blam. All right, done. Um, so now it looks like we have all the tools we need to do this exploit. Um, now we just need to figure out our order of operations here. So, to reiterate, we want to call get shell with um, bin sh as its only argument. So to do that, uh, we first must put the string bin sh into RDI. Um, to do that, we need to use our uh, pop RDI gadget. So the first thing we'll do is pop, well actually, payload uh, plus equals pop. RDI. So, um, 18 bytes of junk, and then we replace the return address with our pop RDI gadget. So this will replace whatever's on the top of the stack uh, into RDI. So, obviously we want our bin sh string on the top of the stack, so we will put that right there. So this will pop bin sh into RDI. And then after that, we want um, to call uh, get shell. So we'll just put that onto the last thing of our payload, and that should be it. Um, let's actually comment this out properly this time. If we run this, we should get a shell. Demo dot pi. Uh, did it work? It did. Awesome. Cool. Um, we just rocked with uh, just a single gadget. Um, but this should show you guys um, kind of the concept of what we're doing here. It's like shell coding, but we don't actually need to write our own shell code to memory. We can just use what's already there uh, to influence things. And this is actually a very powerful technique. Um, but let's get back to the main lecture. And we're back. Okay, so we just finished up the first demo. Um, here is another, or I guess it's a very similar exploit to what we just did together um, with some notes. Uh, the first thing is the, the Pwn Tools elf object. This links to the Pwn Tools documentation. You should definitely uh, take a look at this uh, to see all the things that are possible with the information that you can pull from uh, an elf file and what um, Pwn Tools lets you do with it all. Um, you can access a lot of information from here. Uh, Elf.search lets us look for uh, strings inside of a binary. And uh, elf dot symbols lets us look for uh, lets us uh, query the symbol table for uh, function addresses. 
and that's super, super easy. Um, something that uh, I should definitely say um, that I didn't show, actually, which is bad, but um, pi was disabled on that binary we just did. Pi is the, uh, you know, ROP is fantastic for getting around um, DEP and uh, NX, which are the same thing, by the way, in case you didn't know. Um, but, uh, and also you can use ROP to, you know, it gets around ASLR technically, uh, but Pi shuts it down hard. What Pi does, um, just to remind you guys, is um, Pi randomizes the base address of the binary. So that means things like PLT and GOT locations, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will in just a second. Um, so the code itself is also at a randomized address um, every time. It's just like, it's like ASLR, but for the code, basically. Um, which means that our ROP gadget, we have it hard-coded here. Um, this wouldn't work because it would be at a different address every time the binary is run. Uh, the string uh, bin sh would be at a different location, and of course the um, the address of get shell would be at a different location. So this gets shut down hard by pi, um, and this exploit would not work if it was enabled. Um, and it's uh, pi is typically used in conjunction with ASLR, which just randomizes stack addresses. You guys know this, um, but uh, the difference between the two is um, worth knowing. And uh, also, just a little thing here, uh, if you run a binary in GDB that has pi enabled, no matter what, uh, GDB will load uh, any binary at uh, this address here, like 555555000, um, no matter what, every, that's just what GDB does for some reason. Um, so even if pi is activated, this, this will um, undo the effects of pi, essentially, uh, which is bad uh, if you think that you're a hacking god when really you just um, unknowingly disabled Pi. Uh, what we did, it, this didn't affect us in the demo that I just did because we attack, we uh, ran the process normally and then attached GDB to it using pwn tools. Uh, that we're, we're in the clear for that. That makes it good. Um, we don't have to worry about this. But just in case any of you were running these demos in GDB and were confused on why this is happening or didn't notice that Pi was activated, uh, that's why. Uh, so let's just jump into a second demo here of a more complex ROP problem. And then after that, I'll show you guys a, a second way of doing it um, after I talk a little bit about the PLT and the GOT. All right, so let's introduce the problem here. Um, we have a uh, our, um, our second demo. Uh, let me actually, let's run it first before we do anything cr too crazy. Um, it's called Vol, like they all are, of course. And it says only a ROP champion could solve this one. Uh, luckily we are ROP champions. So, uh, it doesn't actually do anything. Um, uh, doesn't even say hi to us, so I'm going to enjoy hacking this mean, mean-spirited program. Uh, so let's take a look at the disassembly. So... Looks like it says only ROP champion could solve this one. Yep, that checks out. Um, calls get input and then calls get shell for us, like right out the gate. That's pretty neat. They don't usually do that. Uh, let's take a gander into get input. Um, and it's, it doesn't take a ROP champion to see that it's putting 300 bytes into a 64 byte buffer. So that's a um, rookie mistake there. Uh, and then it calls get shell. This is interesting. Let's take a look at this. Um, if x is equal to 0, exit. If y is equal to 0, exit. Um, otherwise, run system bin sh. Oh, that, this is free. We don't even have to do anything. We just have to make sure that x and y are not equal to 0. And then it'll give us a shell for free. Um, unfortunately, I didn't see if x and y aren't declared in here. And get shell doesn't take any parameters. Um, so this means that actually x and y are global variables. Um, and they're located in the uh, data section of the uh, ELF binary. Um, but we just ran it and uh, we didn't get a shell. So that means that uh, X and Y are unfortunately equal to zero. So we need to find a way to set these to be something else. Um, we can try to do it with some good old-fashioned ROP if we just uh, 
let's take a look at like you know uh, what gadgets we have. So, oh man, but there's a lot of gadgets here, uh, and you know we'd have to find the address of X and Y in memory, um, and then we'd have to find some gadgets that could somehow let us write to an arbitrary memory address, and that sounds like a whole thing. Um, let's go back to Ghidra and see if we can find something that'll help us out here. Um, this is interesting. There's a uh, two call me functions, call me one and call me two. And it looks like call me one, it just sets x equal to one and returns. That's awesome. Uh, call me two, unfortunately, seems like there's a bit of a catch here. It takes an integer and only sets y equal to one if the, uh, if the argument is equal to hex 539. But we're ROP geniuses, we can do that no problem. Uh, using these few functions here, it looks like we can hack this easy peasy lemon squeezy. Uh, so let's do that. Okay, uh, I'm going to create another demo.py script and we're going to do this whole thing from scratch. Um, so from pwn import all and uh, we'll do our context.binary spiel. Excellent. Okay, and we'll do the usual find the distance between the return address and the vulnerable buffer. Um, just like we did before. So again, I like to put my payload up here. We'll do cyclic 300 again. GDB so we can see what's up. Send our payload. And then interactive. Just in case we get lucky and we get a shell on our first try. Um, yeah, that looks good. So now we'll just uh, Python 3 it. Cool. B main continue and it looks like S triple A is what we're dealing with. So all right, we're dealing with a 72, 72 character long uh, distance here. Go back into demo. And then get our nice iconic string of A's back that we enjoy so much in this class. So we want 72 A's, and then we want to think about what we're going to do now that we actually have, uh, we can actually get started. Um, so let's look at main. We want to run get shell, which runs by itself, so awesome, nothing we need to do there. But we want to make sure that before get shell runs, we're calling. Uh, call me one and call me two. So, how are we going to figure that out? Luckily, our input gets taken in the get input function, so um, our, our uh, exploit will actually start here. When this function returns, we all have uh, control of this. Um, so from here, after it calls our input and we have control of the stack, we want it to return to uh, call me one and uh, call me two with the correct parameter. So let's do that first. Let's get this all set up. So call me one, we'll, we'll, we'll call that first. Um, just like we did in the previous demo, we'll do, uh, we'll just call it call me one is equal to uh, p64 um, elf dot symbols uh, this is a dictionary, so we can just do elf that symbols uh, call me one, and that should give us our call me one address. And uh, while we're at it, let's just do call me two, just uh, just cause. Uh, and I'll uh, paste that. Cool. Uh, and we'll just do that. Um, again, I lack self confidence. <laughs> So we'll uh, print these both just so we're super, super thorough. 
we'll do it with not trace just to save some time. Yep, all right, cool. Two addresses uh, that are different. Cool. So we got that. Um, and let's just uh, continue building our payload, and we'll go one step at a time. So we already saw established that we want to call call me one first, and uh, set our x equal to one. So that step is done, easy. And for our second one, we need uh, our first parameter to be hex five three nine. So, so like we just did in the last one, our our um, argument has to be. Uh, in RDI before we can um, uh, for us to make this work so we need a, a pop RDI gadget um, and we can find that exactly the same way we did last time do proper dash f fawn into a dash dash search pop RDI RDI variable set it equal to that. Um, and then we want to pop hex 531 into RDI. Or, oops. Now there is no, um, the odds are there is no hex 539. Sorry, I said 531 earlier, I think. Uh, this probably isn't just sitting around in the uh, in the elf for us to use, but uh, no problem. It's just taking an integer, not an integer pointer, so we can just uh, pass this ourselves, put it onto our stack. Um, so zero x five three nine. Let's try to remember that number, and then put that onto our stack. Uh, we'll just do p sixty four zero x zero. 539, I think. No, there's no zero. Just 539. I'm going to be really embarrassed if this is wrong. Uh, no. Okay, cool. So that's good. Work now. We want to call uh, call me2 uh, with this in our RDI, which should set y equal to um, 1. Now let's just double check that we have all the requirements here. So we've called call me one, x is equal to one, um, y is equal to one. And then after that, we want to call get shell. Yeah, we want to call get shell. So that way we can um, uh, go past these. Because after, I'm pretty sure if we run this right now, it'll crash. Because, um, let me see. What this will do is uh, we've we've destroyed the stack, you know. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, we've destroyed the stack at this point. Um, so when call me two returns, I we don't know there will be some junk on the top of the stack, and it won't return to where we want it to. I don't think. So let me uh, man, vim is annoying sometimes. Let me uh, prove that by running our awesome exploit. And I spelt the word payload wrong. I'm sorry if you were. <laughs> For all the viewers at home who saw that and have been dealing with that, I, I apologize. Um, let's run that, see what happens. I should have run this with knob trace. I did not. Okay, yeah, so we seg fault. Um, doesn't look like we get any good information as to where, but I'm pretty sure it's because of what I just said. Um, let's go sort of fix that. We want the address of get shell. Um, and we can do this the same way we've been doing all these other ones. We'll just call this get shell. I just copy and paste it up. The same thing for call me two here. Um, just to go quickly. Spelt the word payload right this time. And if we run it now, I still forgot to run it with knob trace. Um, but either way, yeah, detaching after v fork from child process, that is very promising. Uh, we'll quit out of GDB, and it looks like we have a shell. Awesome. So that's a way of solving this problem. There's actually a couple ways. Um, 
like I said earlier, you could try attacking the global variables themselves and um, robbing to change them, but that's kind of hard to do in a, in a smaller binary like this with not a lot of gadgets available to you. You know, the, a bigger program would have more gadgets for you to play around with. Um, but just for the sake of simplicity, I gave you guys these um, free functions here. Now, there is another way of doing this that's a lot easier than what we just did, but um, I'd feel bad if I didn't explain how it worked first. So, now it is finally time for us to talk about the PLT and GOT, and we need to go back to the slides to do that. Okay, so that was one way of uh, solving that challenge. Uh, I'm going to show you guys the second one uh, in just a second, but first I have a... Um, this is a different exploit script for the same challenge I just showed you guys. Um, it's, it's very similar, and this is uh, available off Blackboard if you want to look at it. But basically I just wanted to outline exactly what we did. So we called, you know, call me one, and that's uh, just easy because it takes no argument. So all we had to do was put that onto our stack. And then um, we just called that, you know, regular, you know, lecture one buffer overflow style. And then we wanted to call call me two with uh, this integer as an argument. So we wanted to pop RDI while secret num was on the top of the stack, or secret num just being hex 0, 5 through 9. And so since that was on the top of the stack, we popped it off, uh, popped it popped it off the stack into RDI, and then there's a uh, and then it returns to the next value on the top of the stack. So this gets removed, and we return to here, uh, where we actually call the function call me two. And then once call me two is run. Uh, it returns and uh, pops our shell uh, address off the stack and then runs that. But, uh, as I promised, we now need to talk about the PLT and GOT. So, this uh, is very, very complicated. Um, it involves, you know, linking, which is a huge, uh, you know, computer science, uh, <laughs> I guess, field. Uh, and um, the rabbit hole goes very deep. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, I highly recommend you read this article, or if um, you find my explanation not very sufficient, we won't be going too deep into it, um, because it is such a huge thing. But if you want it, this is here to, uh, to read. So I talked earlier about um, ELF files and, their, and that how it's split up into sections. Two of these sections are the PLT and the GOT. PLT stands for uh, Procedure Linkage Table, and GOT stands for Global Offset Table. And I'll explain more about that in a second. But uh, when I reference the GOT, I mean the, uh, the GOT PLT. Um, I know that there's two GOT sections, but this is the one we'll be talking about uh, when I reference GOT. Um, and these both have their own respective sections of the binary. So like you might recognize the, uh, the text section is where your code goes, and the data section is where you know global variables are. Um, PLT stores, well, let's just get into it. Uh, PLT, Procedure Linkage Table. Um, it exists to make program startup faster by allowing uh, the program to dynamically link, um, you know, libc and, and uh, foreign function calls that are defined in a separate file and not just in, um, in the binary itself dynamically at runtime. So uh, you may remember from 367, that when you call something like printf or puts, you're not actually, you know, this code isn't built into your binary. It's in a shared object file someplace else on the computer, um, and it's referenced through the PLT. So for every uh, function that you call from uh, an outside source, like libc, um, it gets its own uh, p entry in the PLT, which is, you know, it's a table, so it holds there's an entry for printf, and there's an entry for puts, and there's probably an entry for gets, uh, you know, somewhere in main if it, if it uses gets. Um, and it does all this to make this faster, to, to make uh, the program start up faster, so it doesn't have to resolve these, um, you know, it's basically a stub function, so it doesn't have to resolve the stub function, like, right when you start up the program. It's uh, lazy, it does it when it has to. Um, after, the f after this function is called for the first time, uh, it will be uh, stored. So instead of having to 
find the uh, the libc file every single time you want to um, call printf. It'll just uh, do it the first time and then store it in the global offset table, um, which holds the absolute addresses of functions in external libraries. So when you, well, I have a diagram that'll make this easy to explain on the next slide. But basically the global offset table is consulted by the procedure linkage table when doing function lookup. So if we go into GDB and examine what the procedure linkage table entry for printf actually looks like, you can see that it jumps to the global offset table, and then the global offset table has an address that it jumps to um, for the linker, which is a magic function that somehow um, show, uh, gives you the actual code for printf to run. Um, and that's awesome. So basically, this is what happens. You have your program that you're running, and somewhere in it you call printf, um, and then that references the procedure linkage table and says, okay, um, I want printf. Um, do you have it, GOT? And the GOT says, I don't have it. Um, let me talk to the linker real quick. The linker says, yeah, I got you. Um, let me just uh, hit up libc.so and uh, find uh, the printf code and then uh, return that to you. So that way uh, the printf code is then stored in the GOT. Uh, the GOT is writable by default. Um, and then every time you call printf after that, it won't need to talk to the linker. It'll be a lot faster since the GOT will have the address of printf stored. Um, when I say the GOT is writable, since this is happening at runtime, you know, we, we get write permissions, uh, we need write permissions to the uh, global offset table. So that way uh, this whole process can work. And this is actually what the security mitigation uh, railroad is. Um, and why don't I show you guys that? Oops, I should have had this logged in before. Um, in case you didn't know, if you, uh, yeah, this works. I haven't shown you guys this, this homework yet. But um, if you check sec on it, uh, all of the binaries, I should have mentioned this earlier, actually, um, all of the binaries that, we, that I've demoed so far have pi disabled, NX turned on, ASLR turned on, and um, all of the binaries you've gotten this semester have had railroad at, railroad at partial. And this is actually, this isn't something we turned off. This is a, a default um, value. So when railroad is partial, it means that the global offset table is uh, writable. We have write permissions to the global offset table. And that's good for epic hackers like us because when we want to, um, it gives us the opportunity to overwrite an entry of the global offset table. So when program.c wants to print something, uh, if we say, if we overwrite the, the print entry of the global offset table and say, actually, you know what? Um, we change this to say, actually, system. So you, you call print, but we've changed this to say system. So the global offset table actually asks linker for the address of system and then links uh, printf with system instead. So every time, um, printf is meant to be called, it's actually calling system or, you know, whatever whatever function we want to replace it with. Um, so that's possible because railroad is partial. Uh, when railroad is full, this means that uh, this is not done dynamically anymore. This is all done right when you start the program. Um, and then the global asset table is not writable anymore. Um, but there are reasons why this is not, why that is not the default. Um, I guess it's just uh, common practice where row row is partial, and this is what happens most times when you run a binary. <laughs> so, moving on from that, uh, why do we care? How do we use this? This just means that we can essentially call, just like we've been, you know, uh, using, uh, where is it? Uh, uh, elf dot uh, search. Actually, we're using elf dot symbols to get the address of uh, certain functions. We can use elf.plt to look up the, the address of um, you know, libc functions that are used in our binary. So since we can just pull out the, the address of system we, whenever we want because it's used in the get shell function, we can just call system without having to go through any of the trouble of the other stuff. But I will <laughs> explain this more uh, right now and I'll uh, show you guys how, how uh, we actually write this. Luckily, it's not that different, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, show you guys and walk you guys through this um, the script I've already written. So, 
uh, before, you know, we went through all that trouble of calling of uh, calling call me one and call me two to set x equal to one so that um, it would get around these uh, exit calls and then call system bin sh. But since we now know that a uh, system being a libc function has an entry in the plt, um, we can just use uh, we can just call that entry in the plt um, instead of you know, waiting for it to be called by itself, uh, we can, calling a, a function's plt entry is basically the same thing as uh, calling the function itself. So luckily, Pwn Tools gives us a very nice, um, easy way of calling plt functions. Or uh, looking at plt addresses using just elf.plt, which is, uh, you know, the same thing, very similar to the exact same usage of, um, Elf dot symbols, and we can just look for the plt um, entry of system, and then you know pop bin sh into into as the argument, and then call system bin sh, uh, and easy. We can just do that right out the gate. None of that uh, fancy nonsense we were doing earlier. So using this uh, the tool of the plts, we can actually call any libc function that's included in the um, in the binary. Uh, and uh, actually, just between you and me, Nihal next week is going to show you guys um, a way to call any libc function at all and um, using ROP. And that's going to be really exciting. Um, so yeah, uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to call this powerful because I, I feel like I've called everything powerful so far. But this is, you know, really, really cool, um, you know, big kid hacking that we're doing here. Um, they're still working on, um, you know, hardware-based uh, mitigations for ROP. So it seems like ROP, um, <laughs> the, the beautiful art of ROP is at, is at risk right now with some uh, processor technology that Intel is making. But that is far beyond the scope of this course. Um, yeah, all right, so that's... Uh, we're done talking about that complicated stuff. Uh, we can all safely put our hacker hats back on um, because now it's homework time and uh, time to prove that we are the, the ROP masters that I know that we all are. Um, so the homework is actually kind of, um, there's some tricky steps here um, that are uh, pretty non-standard. So I will show you guys that right now. Let me just take a look here. Yeah, all right, I'll, I'll walk you guys through, um, give you some hints for the homework real quick before I let you all go. Okay, so here we are in the uh, directory for your final homework assignment, I believe. And um, I just want to show you guys because uh, things are a little weird here. So if you try to run the vulnerable binary just uh, by downloading it, you'll get an error. Um, can't open a shared object file. That's because I have a super secret special um, shared object for you guys that this uh, contains the win function. Uh, and the reason I have it like that is because <clears throat> uh, I don't want you guys to be able to just uh, quote unquote cheat and um, just call the win function through the PLT like I just showed you guys. Uh, if you can figure out how to do that, go ahead. Um, but that is not the way I intended for this homework to be done. Again, uh, if you guys have any, there's definitely multiple ways to crack this binary. Um, so some creativity will be uh, rewarded um, in your solutions. But uh, it's definitely not necessary. So, um, yeah, to solve this uh, uh, linker issue right here, we need to uh, use the setup.sh uh, script that I have... Um, available for you guys to download. You run a, run the command source dot slash uh, setup dot sh and uh, after running that you can run the assignment no problem. Um, so that is an extra step that you guys will have to do uh, just for this one assignment only. Uh, so keep in mind of that. Also when you uh, reboot uh, this will not survive. You'll have to do this again. Uh, so keep this. Also everything has to be in the 
in the same directory. So make sure all your stuff is in one place. Um, I also have an instruction file that uh, I think has the, the hints written out that I'm about to verbally say to you, just in case you um, want to check those again. But let's look at the Ghidra. Um, we, uh, I didn't actually look at what it said, but we just uh, ran the program and it said, Fool, you may have an overflow, but no one will ever call my secret functions. Uh, how tantalizing is that? This is a really interesting homework assignment. Uh, I wish I could uh, have homework this cool assigned to me. Uh, but let's take a look at it anyway. Um, calls print assignment, that's exciting. Uh, puts, get input. Geez, I wonder if this is a tough... Nope. 200 bytes into a 64 byte buffer. Classic. Uh, these fools will never learn. Um, and then there's a win function. Let's uh, see what, what's going on in there. Ooh, we can't. We can't look at the win function because it's externally defined. It's only linked dynamically. So we don't know what's actually going on here. Uh, so it's a black box win function. But I, being your noble instructor, will, um, will tell you guys right now that there are three global variables, x, y, and z, that all must have the correct value for the win function uh, to, get, to grant you a shell, which is, of course, the uh, objective of this binary. Also, side note, remember to have ASLR on uh, while you're doing this because this is an ASLR challenge. Uh, so you guys have to use ROP, hopefully, <laughs> unless you figure out a way to do it without ROP. Um, the, those uh, infamous secret functions that he was talking about, they are right here. Uh, aptly labeled the secrets one through three uh, for you to call at your leisure <laughs> using ROP. So um, that should be all the information you need to do this uh, you, for yourselves. Um, any questions, just pop into me and Nihal's office hours. Um, or uh, shoot us an email, or shoot, uh, hit up the piazza. Lots of ways to reach out. Um, but I think you guys should be uh, pretty well equipped to take that on. Um, yeah, that's all I have for uh, today and for this week. Uh, I'll see you guys next time.